As the news of George Floyd's murder sweeps the nation, Black Lives Matter is at the center of American discourse once again. Immediately after covering for obvious racism in their own ranks, the media suddenly creates a racist narrative, so we all know how much they care about fighting racism. Does the left believe that some Black Lives Matter, or all Black Lives Matter? Racism certainly still exists, but nowhere is it more apparent and pervasive than the abortion industry. We will examine the left's weaponization of racism to accrue political power and their religious devotion to the greatest destroyer of black lives. I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unaborted. Welcome to Unaborted with Seth Gruber. Thanks for tuning in today. So it's really been a very gnarly week, a really last gnarly last couple of weeks. Obviously, everything going on with COVID-19, but there's been a lot of uh, race-based news in our politics recently. Some cases that are uh, not obviously racist, some that maybe are a little bit more obviously racist. And this one falls in the camp of not really sure if it's racist, but it's obviously wrong and evil, and we all agree with that. So the horrific news was that on Monday, May 25th, a man by the name of George Floyd was arrested and apprehended by a police officer who then with uh, held him down to the ground with his knee on the man's neck and George Floyd this black 45 something year old man is now dead because of the police brutality of this police officer named Derek Chauvin. So according to Fox News on May 29th by Bernini Chakraborty, he had been arrested after an employee at a grocery store called police to accuse Floyd of trying to pass a counterfeit $20 bill. Um, so strange thing to call the police on someone on, especially because from a distance, you might not even be able to notice if it was a $20 bill that was a counterfeit. But the story goes on and said Floyd, who is black, was then handcuffed by Chauvin, the police officer who is white, and pushed to the ground. And then a cell phone video that went viral shows Floyd's head is turned to the side and he does not appear to be resisting. Chauvin has his knee pressed to the back of Floyd's neck for several minutes as Floyd is seen gasping for air and begging Chauvin to stop. He does not. Bystanders also heard shouting at Chauvin to take his knee off Floyd's neck. Uh, one of the other officers in this video does nothing as Floyd struggles for several minutes before going limp. I mean, really horrible video if you've seen it. Probably have already. It's gone viral. Uh, the a police officer in question responsible for the, for the police brutality, along with the other police officers who stood by and did nothing, have been fired. And as of Friday, May 29th, Derek Chauvin is being charged with third degree murder. So we're all on board with this being evil. Everyone's in agreement with this. And yet we're going to get to some of the nasty partisan politics that are insinuating that one people across the side of the aisle are racist or racist sympathizers who don't believe that black lives matter. Clearly, this was a case of police brutality. Absolutely horrible watching this man saying he can't breathe at the very end asking for his mother, clearly frightened and scared, thinking that he is going to die. And then he goes unconscious, and then by the time an ambulance shows up, they remove his limp body, and he's later announced dead. Absolutely horrible. The guy should have should be fired. He should be charged to the full extent of the law, and uh, and and have his I mean have his pension taken from him. Absolutely despicable. And other reports have come out saying that multiple complaints over the years have been filed against this guy, but no significant disciplinary disciplinary action was taken by. The police chief. But watching these disgusting insinuations arise from the left and even Christians accusing pro-lifers like us of not caring about the brutalization and murder of people of color is truly nasty. And it's becoming more indicative of the state of our politics in 2020, especially in the midst of a increasingly political, politicized event with the virus and the government shutdown. And in an election year, this does not help. It throws fumes onto the flame of our political discourse. So case in point, this pastor by the name of Alex Early, who I'm friends with on Facebook, uh, he's the lead pastor at Redemption Church in Seattle, Washington. And he puts out on Facebook this short post. And again, this is indicative of the of the kind of nastiness in our politics that accuses other people who are all on the same board with this being evil and with this police officer needing to be fired and punished to the full extent of the law of not really 
caring as much about the lives that we claim to care about. And in this case, of not really being pro-life because I don't hear you as involved against racism. I don't hear you raising your voice as loudly against this case of police brutality as you do against the murder of the unborn. So you're not really pro-life. It's really nasty. So this pastor, Alex Early, posts out this. Brothers and sisters who claim to be pro-life, if you lift your voice on abortion but remain silent on the never-ending brutalization of people of color in our country, you are not pro-life. You are pro-birth. Christians are called to be pro-life for all of life, for every life, period. Yes, I said it. He throws in that last line, like knowing he's being bombastic. Yeah, I said it, you stupid pro-lifers. Why am I not seeing a two-minute long Facebook story post on your page about this horrific event? It's really nasty. If your first thought following the, by the way, illegal murder of a black man is to bash pro-lifers who work full-time, part-time, and volunteer their time to end the illegal killing of one million babies every year, you're doing being a human wrong. It's really nasty. Secondly, virtually every pro-life leader I know and that I'm connected with on the interwebs because I'm in this movement full time, has released public statements posting publicly about the murder of George Floyd, mourning the loss of his death and demanding justice against this POS police officer who kneels his entire body weight through his knee onto the man's neck for eight minutes. Virtually every pro-life leader I know in the movement in the public square, in public life, has released some type of statement. And yeah, yeah, he's insinuating that somehow pro-lifers of the pro-life movement are just pro-birth because, ooh, you're remaining silent on the brutalization of black people. It's really, really sick. And it goes without saying that the brutalization of black people is happening every day. Black-on-black deaths and murders are significantly higher than white-on-black murders. And yet we're not hearing any massive mainstream media week-long stories on that or using that as a way to accuse pro-lifers of not really being pro-life. Everyone's virtually silent on those when it happens. But if it's a white person who kills a black person, even if there's no evidence of racism, then we're going to put a racist narrative onto it and then tell pro-lifers who make very little money, many of them make none because they volunteer to save babies in the womb, that they're just pro-birth. It's really sick. And Alex Early should shut his trap. He's a pastor. He shouldn't be accusing pro-lifers who have been fighting to save unborn children without the involvement of the church of not really being pro-life. Thirdly, the reason the pro-life movement is louder on abortion than anything else is because it's a pro-life movement. Yeah, it's a movement about being pro-life, and pro-life means being against abortion and trying to end abortion. So it's kind of like a bunch of people who get together to achieve one goal. So naturally, the pro-life movement is louder on abortion than they are on other things because the pro-life movement's goal is to end abortion. Imagine asking why the American Cancer Society isn't as vocal about AIDS. Oh, I don't hear you trying to end abortion or AIDS. Yeah, because they're American Cancer Society. That's their goal is to end cancer. That's not their focus. That should be obvious. Fourthly, when is America not united in calling unjustified killing wrong? Except abortion. We're not we're not uh, united on that. But in any other form of unjustified killing, we're pretty united, aren't we? Ever since we ended slavery and then ended racial segregation and basically threw the KKK into the ash heap of history, they're still around, but not in any meaningful way, we've been fairly united against the unjustified killing of the innocent. Anytime there is an example of unjustified violence or murder against innocents, regardless of skin color, by the way, Americans are pretty damn united in calling it evil and demanding and expecting justice. And the tragic and horrific murder of George Floyd is case in point of that. Bipartisan unity, calling this evil and expecting justice. Unity amongst pro-aborts and pro-lifers calling it evil and and expecting justice. But that's not what you're seeing from the media, and that's not what you're seeing from pastors like Alex Early who were saying that really pro-lifers are just silent on the brutalization of peoples in color, so they're really just pro-birth. Really, really sick. Fifthly, you also – you can't expect the same level of involvement, devotion, or response from everyone when something like this happens. For example – Would we expect the folks at the International Justice Mission, IJM, the people who fight sex trafficking and rescue women from the trade and try to expose traffickers, would we expect the people at IJM to bear responsibility 
for ending racism or abortion? Would we expect them to be as vocal and loud about ending abortion or racism as they are to ending sex trafficking? No, of course not, because when an organization or a group of people have a narrow-minded approach and focus to doing one thing and doing it well, they're more effective because of it, because they fight sex trafficking. That's their goal. And they wouldn't be as effective if society demanded that they demonstrate their opposition to racism by doing more. I, I don't hear anyone on the left bashing the international justice mission or other justice causes for not being as vocal about racism as they are about what they do every day. It's only the pro-life movement that gets that accusation. But if you're pro-life and you spend your life trying to end literally the greatest injustice in human history, then self-important pastors like this one will literally accuse you of not being pro-life and only wanting the baby to be born because you didn't illustrate a sufficient level of commitment or devotion to ending racism. It's so disingenuous. Sixthly, um, abortion is legal, obviously. Murdering or assaulting innocent human beings outside the womb, regardless of their skin color, is illegal. This action by this police officer was illegal, and he's being charged with third-degree murder. Abortion is legal. So true in now true incidents of racially motivated violence or murder is rare in America, despite the narratives that the media wants to push. An actual demonstrable incident of a racially motivated hate crime or murder is rare. And when they happen, they are always illegal because it's illegal to tr uh, assault or murder innocent human beings. And when it happens, it's followed by a criminal investigation and everyone expects justice. And that's what's happening in this case. The wheels of justice are turning. That's good. He's been fired, as were the other cops who stood by and did nothing. And he's being charged with third degree murder. However, there are no wheels of justice that turn for the unborn. And the murder of the innocent unborn children in our country is not rare, unlike cases of demonstrable incidents of racial violence. The murder of the unborn is not rare. 3,000 babies a day are murdered through abortion, which, by the way, disproportionately targets black babies. So pretending like that's n that, that those aren't different is ludicrous, as pro-lifers devote the vast majority of their time and resources to saving babies for whom it's currently legal to kill – but then critiquing them of only being pro-birth because they didn't raise a sufficient level of volume that this pastor wanted to one horrific incidents of maybe racism. Alex Early says in this post, Christians are called to be pro-life for all of life, for every life, period. Well, guess what, Alex? There is only one example of an innocent human life in America for whom it is currently legal to kill the unborn. So naturally, pro-lifers spend more time and energy ending abortion. That should be self-evident. Accusing pro-lifers of not really being pro-life because you perceive them as being silent or uncaring about the brutalization of peoples of colors is disgusting, untrue, and based on a fantasy narrative that is pushed by a partisan media. And we're going to get to that partisan media in a second and the really nasty state of our politics and how these political operatives are using a case that isn't demonstrably uh, proven to be racist yet to push that it's racist and then accuse people across the aisle of not caring about racism and then how that impacts the debate over abortion. But first, uh, we're offering a new feature here at Unaborted. Starting soon, I'll be taking your questions on the show, anything related to the abortion debate, to our politics, to our culture, to the church, to faith, to family, and uh, just give you my thoughts on it and hopefully help you in your pursuit to be a voice for the unborn. So we'll be right back with more of this nasty partisan politics and this racial event and how it correlates to abortion in just one second. In the meantime, I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unaborted. <laughs> Welcome back to Unaborted with Seth Gruber. You know, it's been said that if the left didn't have double standards, they wouldn't have any standards at all. And that is an astute observation of the left and the mainstream media. But I repeat myself, according to the mainstream media, in the midst of this government shutdown, which is politicizing everything, and this horrific case of police brutality that led to the death of George Floyd, racism is evil when it's politically advantageous to say so. Racism is bad and evil and disgusting 
but we'll only say that when it's politically advantageous for the goals that we want to enshrine in American politics. Immediately after covering for obvious racism in their own ranks, the media suddenly creates a racist narrative so we all know how much they care about fighting racism. And this has been made more evident than ever before in the case of Joe Biden, who recently said in a podcast show interview with a man named Charlemagne, the God of the Breakfast Club podcast, that if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, then you ain't black. This is literally what Joe Biden said. And uh, just so you know, I'm not making something as ludicrous of this as this up, even though you've probably already seen it. We're going to play that clip for you now. Listen, you got to come see us when you come to New York, VP Biden. Cause it's I a, will. It's a long way until November. We got more questions. You got more okay. questions. But I tell you, if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, then you ain't black. It don't have nothing to do with Trump. It has to do with the fact I want something for my community. <laughs> <laughs> Un unbelievable. Being black means being a Democrat. That's what Joe Biden is saying. You, see, see, your political persuasion is actually determined by the amount of melanin in your skin. <laughs> well, that comes as news to people like Condoleezza Rice and Alan West and Clarence Thomas, who currently sits on the Supreme Court. And the uh, the big the one of the biggest black bloating voting blocks for Trump than any Republican president has had in a long time. And you're seeing a growing wave of support for Trump in the black community, um, even above and beyond what he had in 2016. This is unbelievable. This is a really bad look for Joe Biden. White Democrats telling black Americans how they should think <laughs> isn't a good look. In fact, historically, it's a pretty dangerous look because, uh, you know, white Democrats were kind of all for slavery and racial segregation. And yet the media rushed to cover for him. I mean, this is this this line is, is clearly racist. There's no explaining that away. I, as a white Democrat who has been in the in the Democratic Party forever and has been a Democrat for my entire lot, life, is going to tell black Americans that your political opinions have to be dictated by the color of your skin. That is so racist to boil down one's entire identity and thoughts on life as an autonomous individual to the scalp color of their skin is in fact racist. And yet the Washington Post comes running to bat for Joe Biden in this piece here. And I'll just show you the title literally entitled, come on, Biden's you ain't black comment was clearly a joke. <laughs> and there has been no significant coverage of Biden's comment by the mainstream media. There's been no calls or demands for him to step down and abandon his campaign because he's a racist. By the way, same thing they did with Ralph Northam, the governor of Virginia, right, who we've talked about on the show because he's publicly defended infanticide on a, on, on a radio show where he basically said, well, if a baby's born alive during a botched abortion, we'd make the baby comfortable. We'd resuscitate the baby if that's what the mother wanted. And then the mother and the doctor would have a conversation about a baby that's already born, you sick freak. There's nothing to have a conversation about. And of course, this sparked the Senator Ben Sass from Nebraska to, to propose the Born Alive Abortion Survivors Protection Act in large part in reaction to Ralph Northam's um, unashamedly pro-abortion infanticidal propaganda. But around the same time, a photo came out from Ralph Northam's yearbook, which I believe was his graduate school, and on his – it's his page, right? It's his yearbook page with his name on it with pictures of him and friends <laughs> and things about his life. And there are – there is a picture of two men. One is dressed in blackface and one is dressed in a KKK costume. And one of those is Ralph Northam. And initially he said one of those is me and then later probably being coached by his uh, partisan political advisors came back and said, actually, I, none of those are me. I don't remember this at all. <laughs> well, OK. OK, Ralph Northam. He was literally dressed in blackface, which, of course, was a very – racist way to portray African-Americans uh, historically during slavery and then during the civil rights movement. And yet there were no major calls by the left or mainstream media outlets for his resignation. And now it's like the thing never happened. By the way, compare that blackface political moment to Megyn Kelly's black face political moment. <laughs> you remember like not that long ago, a year or less, two years, maybe. Megyn Kelly on NBC was saying that she didn't see exactly how dressing up with 
black makeup to portray a black star whom you love, like Diana Ross, was racist. Now, you know, maybe she didn't have a proper understanding of the historical use of blackface, but there have been other uh, mainstream media entertainers in Hollywood who have dressed in blackface and never really gotten significant hot water because of it. But because Megyn Kelly says, well, what if it's someone like Diana Ross, someone that you really like love and you actually look up to? And so you dress in black makeup because you want to portray them at Halloween. How is that racist? Oh, my gosh. They lit into her for weeks and NBC fired her for just not defending anything that was that she perceived as racist, but for just saying, well, I mean, isn't that it's kind of cool that like maybe a a young white girl wants to dress up as a black singer who she admires and she gets her entire career ruined and is fired from NBC. If Ralph Northam dresses in blackface, it's okay. If Megyn Kelly does it, it's not okay. And if Joe Biden says that you're literally not black if you are a Republican or if you vote for Trump or if you can't even decide between me or Trump, then you're not black. Then they will run to bat for him and cover for him every step of the way. Really, really disgusting. So after making light of racism because it was on their side of the political aisle, the mainstream media now is creating a racist narrative to pretend they actually take racism very seriously. Well, you didn't take it very seriously when Joe Biden was saying it. You didn't take it very seriously when Ralph Northam was dressing in blackface. But now now you take it really, really seriously. Because unfortunately, which we all agree it's unfortunate and evil, a black man was killed. And so now you have a political opportunity to politicize it and, and infuse it with racism so you can accrue political power and accuse those on the other side of the aisle of somehow being unfeeling apathetic to racism or at at the very worst being racist sympathizers really really sick so if there's obvious racism from a white democrat it's silence but if there's maybe racism from a white police officer then it's definitely racism there is no evidence yet by the way that the murder of george floyd was racially motivated it's horrific and the police officer has already had multiple uh, complaints filed against him guy's obviously a pos (laughs) he's obviously not a good police officer but was it racist There's no evidence of that yet, but you wouldn't know that if you thought that the mainstream media was actually full of uh, journalistic firefighters. Gail King from CBS This Morning said it feels like open season on black people because there's been a couple incidents, right? There was a man who was running through the construction site and was apprehended by a father and son who thought that he was trespassing and had seen him trespass before. And there was an altercation and they end up shooting him. And then there was the woman, white, a good white liberal in Central Park, calling the cops on a black man in Central Park who was giving treats to her dog because she wouldn't leash her dog. And so now there's all these incidents that ooh could be perceived as racist. And so she's saying, man, all this, it just – it feels like an open season on black people. Really? An open season on black people. Who's calling for that and who supports that? And then Joe Biden releases a statement saying black lives are under threat every single day. Every single day. You see how they're politicizing this, infusing it with racism when it's not demonstrably been proven that the murder of George Floyd was racist yet in order to accrue political power, continue to fear monger black Americans to vote for Democrats and then accuse others on the other side of the aisle of being unfeeling about racism. And then, of course, Don Lemon talking with Chris Cuomo the other day, and he tells Chris Cuomo that Trump traffics in an environment that helps to lead to these kinds of situations where people think that these actions are normal. (laughs) Really, really disgusting. And you see, right, how they're politicizing it and weaponizing racism to accrue political power by demonizing those on the other side of the aisle. So here is Don Lemon speaking out of his rear end to Chris Cuomo. Maybe I need to understand or realize that the environment that this president has trafficked in can help to lead to these sorts of situations where people think that that sort of behavior, meaning the people who are doing these things, the people who are um, calling the cops on people falsely in Central Park, the people who are chasing people down the street in Georgia and killing them, that you may begin to think that your actions are normal, are normal. That you may begin to think that you as the preeminent voice can do things that are inhumane to other people, and it will be accepted. 
and it will be accepted. So you see the environment that President Trump and his supporters is really what Don Lemon is saying traffics in creates an environment where police brutality by kneeling your knee onto the necks of black men for eight minutes is acceptable. How ra basically racism is acceptable because of the environment that Trump traffics in. That's what Don Lemon is saying. And that therefore, and that furthermore, the people who perpetrate these horrific actions will actually be perceived as being acceptable. All because of what? All because of the actions and rhetoric of Trump and his deplorable supporters. Really, really disgusting. So you see how they're weaponizing racism, infusing events that have not been demonstrably proved to be racism to be racist, to fearmonger with particularly black Americans who the Democratic Party have treated like political pawns for decades – in order to scare them into continuing to vote for Democrats, because only Democrats take racism seriously, not Republicans. Republicans are racist, and and uh, and they would love to put y'all back in chains, as Joe Biden once said. But not us. We care about Black Americans, so vote for us. Despite the fact that any city with decades long dem uh, Democratic leadership have horrific rates of poverty, broken homes, broken families, high rates of fatherlessness, high rates of abortion, because they have created a a dependency on the state where they're not incentivized to go and provide for their family and make the type of future that um, you can really only build in America. This type of weaponization of racism by Don Lemon is what the Democrats have been doing for decades, using racism as a political cudgel to bash and demonize Republicans as like racist sympathizers, despite the fact that you'll not find any Republican defending what happened here, while signaling how serious they take racism. We, we're the only ones that take it really seriously. Because if you support Trump, then you're trafficking in an environment that encourages and makes this type of actions permissible, according to Don Lemon. If you only care about fighting racism when it's politically advantageous, you don't care about racism. If you don't call out and fight racism wherever you see it, then you don't care about the evils of racism. You only care about calling it out when it's politically advantageous. If you invent racist narratives to fulfill political goals for the America you want to see while ignoring actual incidents of racism on your own side of the aisle, then racism doesn't actually concern you, does it? It's just a tool for you to use when convenient to achieve political ends. And I think that is what is glaringly obvious in what has come out from members of the left in the mainstream media after this horrific murder and police brutality of George Floyd. Well, next we're going to examine really the most blatant example of, of how racism actually is alive and well today. And that would be in the abortion industry and the left's decades-long Joe Biden treatment of that racism, which is to pretend that it's not there. But first, if you like this show and want to hear more great content and commentary from the front lines of the abortion wars and the pro-life movement, then considering become a patron of this of this show, this podcast, by heading over to patreon.com slash unaborted and sign up for 5, 10, 15, 20, whatever you can afford a month. And that really helps us expand our production value. We want to move into more types of content and more frequent types of content by taking this type of pro-life training and ideas into the public square, onto the streets, and have having conversations with people about abortion and showing them evidence that they haven't seen or heard before and encouraging them to reconsider their ideas by examining reality, <laughs> by pursuing truth, which we have make a high priority on the show to pursue at all ends. Greg Cunningham once said that there are more people working full-time to kill babies than there are working full-time to save them. That's because killing babies is very profitable while saving them is very costly. Help us with some of those costs so we can reach more young people, Christian leaders, and parents with a pro-life show of like-minded individuals so they can get equipped to defend life and be the pro-life generation. Head on over to patreon.com slash unaborted, and we'll be right back with a whole lot more. Welcome back to Unaborted with Seth Gruber. So while the left and the mainstream media, but again, I repeat myself, attempt to create racist narratives and infuse a horrific event of police brutality with racism in order to accrue political power and glorify the Democratic Party and demonize the Republican Party, there are actual significant examples of racism today in America. And I'm going to argue that they're no more apparent and rampant 
than in the abortion industry itself. And the left has been, attempt, has been participating in a decades-long attempt to give the abortion industry the same type of treatment that they give Joe Biden and Ralph Northam or anyone else in their party that exposes any type of racist or bigoted um, under pinnings. They're just going to deny that and pretend like it's not there or even worse, rush to those people defense by saying, come on, we all know that it was just a joke. And they've been doing this to the abortion industry for decades. And yet the abortion industry is the clearest example of how racism is still alive and well today in America. And like I said, if you're not willing to call out racism wherever you find it, then you don't actually care about racism. You care about molding it into a political cudgel to beat Republicans and pro-lifers over the head as unfeeling or racist sympathizers while you pander as some type of MLK in modern flesh to fear mongered black Americans to get their vote. Margaret Sanger, who was the founder of Planned Parenthood, okay, was a racist and eugenicist who spoke at KKK rallies and wanted to use forced birth control to weed out blacks, disabled, and the mentally ill. That's who Margaret Sanger is. That's the founding of Planned Parenthood. Care no matter what. Except, in reality, it's eugenics no matter what. Racism no matter what. Margaret Sanger wrote a piece in Birth Control Review entitled Birth Control and Racial Betterment. I'm going to say that again. Birth Control and Racial Betterment. Using birth control to obtain racial betterment. And she was a racist and member of the KKK. So she wanted to use birth control to get rid of black people. So much for those black lives mattering. She wrote in this piece, quote, Before eugenicists and others who are laboring for racial betterment can succeed, they must first clear the way for birth control. <laughs> so she's saying if you're a racist who want to get rid of black lives – you got to set up the strategy in place to use birth control to achieve those ends. She says, like the advocates of birth control, the eugenicists, for instance, are seeking to assist the race toward the elimination of the unfit. Birth control of itself, by freeing the reproductive instinct from its present chains, will make a better race. Eugenics without birth control seems to us a house built upon the sands. It is at the mercy of the rising stream of the unfit. So without birth control, we can't achieve our eugenics utopia, but we can use birth control to achieve that utopia by getting rid of black people. This is the founder of Planned Parenthood, folks. And she wrote a letter, which we have the original copy of, in which I've read a photocopy of, to a doctor named Dr. Clarence Gamble. And in that letter, she made one damning sentence that should have ruined the integrity and reputation of Planned Parenthood decades ago if you care about calling racism out wherever you find it. And she said, we do not want word to get out that we want to exterminate the Negro population. Now, when Planned Parenthood was founded, they were not performing abortions. That came later. But when it was founded, it was used part and parcel to get rid of the unfit, the mentally unfit, the disabled, and African Americans. And guess what? Planned Parenthood still gives out the Margaret Sanger Award. Guess who one of the recipients of that award is? Hillary Flipping Clinton, who has been BFFs with, uh, with every president of Planned Parenthood and, of course, would have been America's most pro-abortion president. So Planned Parenthood has made no attempt to distance themselves from people who were racists while claiming that those in the Democratic Party and the mainstream media who respond to the beck and call of the abortion industry – actually care about racism. No, you don't if you're only willing to call out racism when it's politically expedient. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, African Americans account for about 13%, 13.4% of the population, but they obtained 36% of the country's abortions from 2015 figures according to the CDC. So a racial group that comprises 13% of the American public obtains 36% of the abortions. That's massively disproportionate. Um, that is on the higher end. Some studies have suggested 28% of the country's abortions. So between 28 and 36% of the annual abortions are obtained by black women, despite the fact that the black community represents 13.4% of the population. So you're left with this truth that abortion is the number one killer of the African-American 
community. Horrific. Of all the different types of deaths that plague the black community, some of them being disproportionately higher than those same diseases or deaths are in other racial groups, abortion is significantly higher. So that means that, that Planned Parenthood alone kills all more black lives in two weeks than the KKK lynched in a century. Planned Parenthood, all black lives matter. Remember when it started, Planned Parenthood jumped on that bandwagon and said, we stand with black lives matter. And the black lives matter organization and website has Planned Parenthood affiliates on there and abortion industry affiliates on there, reproductive rights affiliates. Planned Parenthood kills more black lives in two weeks than the KKK did in a century. Oh, yes, but you're the anti-racist. You're MLK reincarnated. You care about all black lives. Give me a break. So the most dangerous place for an African-American to be today in America is in the womb. You're more likely to be murdered as an African-American life, human being, when you're in your mother's womb than by any supposedly racist cop or otherwise. Planned Parenthood and the abortion juggernaut know the disproportionate amount of abortions that the black community obtains. They know that. They know the statistics. So we shouldn't be surprised when Planned Parenthood's business strategies reflect that information, reflect the knowledge that African-American women obtain a disproportionate amount of abortions. The Center for Urban Renewal and Education published a policy report in 2015 entitled The Effects of Abortion on the Black Community. And in that study, that report, they cited a study by Protecting Black Life that found that, quote, 79 percent, nearly 80 percent of Planned Parenthood surgical abortion facilities are strategically located within walking distance of African and Hispanic communities. So Planned Parenthood strategically plans the construction and geographical location of their clinics to be easily accessible by a racial group who obtains a disproportionate amount of abortions to make it easier to kill black lives, to abort them, fulfilling the dream and the utopia of Margaret Sanger, which was less black people in America. Planned Parenthood is conveniently located to make it quick and easy to import and exterminate as many unwanted and undesirable black lives as possible. Oh, but one horrific incident that we all believe is horrific where a black man was killed was racism and therefore we have to blow up the mainstream media narrative and accuse those on the other side of the aisle for not being sufficiently anti-racist because they're not as loud as we are. While you turn a blind eye and cover for an organization and industry that kills more black lives in two weeks than the KKK lynched in a century and who plans the location of their clinics to exterminate and import as many undesirable black babies as possible. Disgusting. So do some black lives matter or do all black lives matter? The left answer, just the born ones. Just the born ones, not the small and dependent ones, not the ones who are the most in need of our protection. The left and the mainstream media don't get to wax and wane about their outrage over invented cases of racism and the murder of people of color if they are willing to vote for racism and the murder of people of color. All of these infanticidal, fetocidal apologists in the mainstream media who are just pro-choice, right? They're just reproductive health advocates who decry racism and infuse narratives with racism are the very ones who will vote for any candidate as long as they're pro-abortion. If you're pro-life, Get the hell out of town. In fact, if you're a pro-life Democrat, get the hell out of town. Pete Buttigieg, Joe Biden, the Democratic Party have made that very clear. If you're a pro-life Democrat, get the bleep out of here. So it's not just being a Democrat. It's that you have to be pro-abortion. The attorneys general, the Democrat Attorneys General Association last year, and we covered this in the show, said that if you're going to get our support and financial backing in your political campaign to run for attorney general in any given state, you have to come up with a public statement to the mainstream media saying you're pro-abortion and will defend reproductive rights. The message is clear. If you're pro-life in the Democratic Party, get the hell out of town. Ideological uniformity is always the goal of the left. And so if you don't align with their ideology, they will ostracize you. So the very people who claim to be the anti-racists, who claim to be the modern-day MLKs, are the ones enabling, backing, voting for, and funding the very politicians who enshrine a woman's right to choose, who defend the 
more killings of black lives in two weeks than the KKK lynched in the century. You don't get to tell your black neighbor you love them, but that you also also think it should be legal to kill them. It doesn't work that way. Oh, just provided that they're small and defenseless. We'll, we'll tell the born and more independent black lives that they matter and that we don't want to kill you. But if you're black and in the womb, then we need to actually sanction your dismemberment. Tell black women that they can't really be mothers if they can't afford another child so they could kill you and then fund it with your tax dollars. It doesn't work that way. The same people pretending to be torn apart, broken, and infuriated over this unverified incident of racism are the same people who joke about donating organs to keep Ruth Bader Ginsburg alive so they can protect abortion on demand, which is the number one killer of the black community. The same people that accuse Republicans and pro-lifers of being apathetic toward racial violence or even racist sympathizers are the same people who defended Christine Blasey Ford's obviously bogus sexual allegation assault against Brett Kavanaugh. Why? To prevent a conservative from getting on the Supreme Court, who would then stop the murder of the unborn, which disproportionately targets black babies. The same people that pretend to be modern day Martin Luther King Jr.'s in flesh because they take racism seriously, unlike those Republican rubes are the same people using this government shutdown to sue the FDA into lifting their requirements that prevent the sale of the abortion pill online. Why? Because they want to sell more abortions. And online is the best way to do that when there's a government shutdown. Because according to them, women, especially women of color, and this is coming from the horse's mouth, they need ease of access to abortion services, especially now. Especially now. Black women and black families who by a median average, make less than the white family, they really need to have access to abortion pills online right now because many of them have lost their jobs due to the shutdown and their families can't afford to have another kid. They're literally telling black women that they don't have what it takes to be a mother in difficult times and so they should take a dangerous abortion pill to kill their baby because that's empowering and that's not racist at all. Unbelievable. You have to pick your narrative. Do some black lives matter or do all black lives matter? And, you know, I've been critiqued and criticized for being so critical <laughs> of Black Lives Matter because of their pro-abortion position. I, I've been told, Seth, you know, at least they're calling out bad things. Like, why do you critique them? Why are you such – why are you so critical about them? Okay, so they're not pro-life, but they're calling out something that's bad and that's good that they're calling that out. And, and you should encourage people doing that. We obviously don't want cases of police brutality. And if they're racist, incidences of police brutality, we certainly don't want that. So each movement is entitled to its outrage, I've been told. So, so just, just stop going so hard after Black Lives Matter and leftists who, who care about the lives of born black people, even if they don't care about the lives of unborn black people. Really. If you were to put that critique of me in any other context, would anyone respect the validity of that critique? I think not. Let me, let me tell you what I mean by that. Let's say instead of the critique being about Black Lives Matter not being pro-life but being against racism and racial violence and police brutality, what if instead it was me who as a pro-life person was considering policies – that would re-legalize lynching as long as it was done so by a nonprofit organization and uh, funded by the taxpayer dollar. What if I, as a pro-life individual, who, by the way, the pro-life movement fights to save more black lives than anyone else because nearly 300,000 black babies are killed every year in America, so it's the largest wholesale slaughter of blacks in uh, American history. <laughs> so pro-lifers actually care a lot about black lives because they're seeking to prevent the, the only type of m murder in the black community that's still legal, abortion. But put that aside. Let's say my, as a pro-lifer, I say, yeah, but I'm willing to consider politicians who would re-legalize lynching and uh, property ownership, meaning slavery, as long as it was done so by just one organization. And, uh, you know, we want to make sure that people who are trained in uh, property and racial health care, um, know how to do these procedures uh, carefully, then I'd be willing to consider that. Would anyone take my pro-life conviction seriously about the value of life in the womb if I simultaneously backed politicians and maybe even funded organizations that were promoting lynchings and slavery? Of course not. Of course not. 
I would undercut my entire position and credibility, wouldn't I? And it would be right of others to expose me for the fraud that I would be, well, right? I can't claim to care about black lives in the womb and then endorse and fund the slaughter of black lives out the womb. It doesn't work that way. But if I say that about people who pretend to care about racism but back the most racist organization in American history, Planned Parenthood, responsible for the biggest slaughter of black lives in American history, oh, then I'm just being unfairly critical. Oh, spare me. Ridiculous. If you care about science, care about facts, you have to follow where those facts lead, which is that life begins at the moment of conception. Okay, well, you say it's not a person. Okay, whatever functions you come up with and demand that the unborn meet to be a person can equally be used to find a born person who doesn't adequately meet those same functions and could therefore be dehumanized and killed as well according to your same standards. So the only way to maintain human equality and equal treatment under the law is by grounding human value and a right to life in the only thing we have in common, which is what? A human nature. That's the only thing we have in common. And that human nature began at the moment of conception. If that's true, then the only way for these partisan hacks who are using, who are weaponizing racism to attack their political opponents and fear monger amongst black Americans to hold up votes, the only way for them to be consistent and credible in the public square is to decry racism wherever they see it. Not when it's politically expedient, not when it's only on the other side of the aisle, wherever you see it. And I'm making the point, as I have for the last 15 minutes, that the abortion industry and Planned Parenthood, the patron saint of the Democratic Party, is the biggest example of American racism today and is responsible for the murder of more black lives than the KKK or Margaret Sanger could have ever dreamed of in their wildest daydreams. So I believe that all black lives matter. But the organization Black Lives Matter doesn't believe that. They only believe that born black lives matter. And they, unfortunately, have been some of the most vocal defenders of the destruction of black lives in the womb, as long as they're small and dependent and can't speak up for themselves and say, please don't dismember me. Unbelievable. Absolutely disgusting. So we are all in agreement. This is wrong. This is horrible. There's not been a single pro-life or a Republican who's expressed sympathy for the murder of George Floyd or is who just shrugged it off. We're all calling for justice. It's not clear that it's racist, but it's obviously evil and wrong. We're all on the same page. Unfortunately, I think that our political discourse is past a point to where it can be reeled in or saved. So either pro-lifers and conservatives can simply play the nice game and not attack our political opponents in any meaningful or credible way because we want to play nice. We, want not, we don't want to participate in the bombastic nature of American politics and let the left run roughshod over our politics, over freedom, over liberty, and of course over the lives of unborn children. Or we can meet them on the battlefield. And we can give them a little bit of taste of their own medicine. If they're going to, if this pastor, Alex Early, is going to critique me and pro-lifers completely, unashamedly, and based off of no evidence that we're just pro-birthers, we're not really pro-life, that insinuation is that we don't give two bleeps about that baby once it's born, which is demonstrably false if you know anything about the pro-life movement and pregnancy resource centers. But you'll have pastors like Alex Early critiquing pro-lifers of not really being pro-life because he hasn't perceived the same level of outrage to one isolated, horrific incident of police brutality, which is not even demonstrably racist yet. And so therefore, all of you pro-lifers are just pro-birth because you're not as vocal about on your Facebook story and Instagram posts as I was about this isolated incident, which isn't true, to be, which hasn't been proven to be racist yet. We can either take that type of critique and take it lying down and not fight back, or we can say, no, that's a bunch of BS. The pro-life movement is the movement of human equality. We're the biggest defender of black lives because the largest slaughter of black lives is happening in the womb. And the pro-life movement devotes the vast majority of their time and resources, often for little in exchange, to save those lives. Oh, and then, by the way, we provide parenting resources, housing, financial assistance, and communities of care through pregnancy resources, centers, and churches to care for those families after they're born. 
and we can push back on the narrative with reality and with facts and exposing them for the frauds that they actually are in reality rather than the frauds that they perceive us to be based off of a partisan fantasy narrative. If you're not willing to call out racism wherever you see it, then you're a partisan hack who only weaponizes racism when it's politically expedient to demonize the Republican Party and to glorify the Democratic Party in large part so you can continue to defend abortion, which is the patron saint of the Democratic Party. I believe all black lives matter. The pro-life movement believes all black lives matter. And that's why, despite the gaslighting of the mainstream media and self-important pastors like Alex Early, all pro-lifers are horrified by what happened to George Floyd. And we have condemned it as such, and we also demand and expect justice. But we demand and expect justice any time violence is perpetrated against innocent human beings in an unjustified way. And abortion is the greatest example of unjustified violence against innocent human beings. It's legal, and it disproportionately affects black lives. Well, that's all we have time for, for today. If you want to uh, engage with me online or learn more about this show, um, head on over to sethgruber.com, S-E-T-H-G-R-U-B as in baby boy, E-R. Uh, dot com and give this sh uh, show a rating and review. Um, that really helps us reach more people, uh, especially during a time where more people are engaging with online content because we can't gather in person. So head on over to iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, give the show a rating and, and review, give it to a friend, give it to a leftist friend, uh, and maybe challenge how they think about pro-lifers and this conversation over all black lives mattering. Of course, on my website, you can subscribe to my speaking schedule, my newsletter for training videos, or to book me for an event. Thanks so much for tuning in. Until next week, I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unavoidable.